One of the other key passages that we took from Plato's Republic was the idea that population should be controlled and unwanted life should be disposed of like trash. In other words, that some were worthy of life and others weren't. This is a concept that comes through in Darwin's ideas about survival of the fittest. If we are evolving towards individual perfection by natural means, that would mean that collectively we are in fact evolving towards a utopian society of perfect men and women. However, in that case, those with perceived poor genetic material would be slowing that collective evolution, and so the whole process could be accelerated by getting rid of those who are not made of the right stuff. The end goal of a utopian society of purebred humans would justify the means of getting rid of the lesser ones. Remember that the full title of Origin of Species was On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favoured Races in the Struggle for Life. One of the major influences on Darwin was a man called Thomas Malthus, who received the blessings of French deist Jean-Jacques Rousseau and famous Scottish philosopher David Hume. Incidentally, David Hume has a prominent statue on Edinburgh's Royal Mile, and if you look at the back of it, you will see this sun god symbol. Now, Thomas Malthus authored a document called The Essay on the Principle of Population, where he concluded that, amongst other things, society should adopt policies that prevent the human population from growing disproportionately larger than the food supply. Malthus, again finding a route in Plato's Republic, proposed genocide to make sure this didn't happen. Specifically, he thought to target the poor. He says, Instead of recommending cleanliness to the poor, we should encourage contrary habits. In our towns, we should make the streets narrower, crowd more people into the houses and court the return of the plague. In the country, we should build our villages near stagnant pools and particularly encourage settlement in all marshy and unwholesome situations. But above all, we should reprobate specific remedies for ravaging diseases and those benevolent but much mistaken men who have thought they were doing a service to mankind by projecting schemes for the total extirpation of particular disorders. Malthus believed that by such methods, the undesirables in society could be effectively culled. He said regarding children, We are bound in justice and honour formally to disclaim the right of the poor to support. To this end, I should propose a regulation be made declaring that no child born should ever be entitled to parish assistance. The illegitimate infant is comparatively speaking of little value to society, as others will immediately supply its place. All children beyond what would be required to keep up the population to this desired level must necessarily perish, unless room be made for them by the deaths of grown persons. The logic behind the idea that those who serve society least should be destroyed was echoed under Darwinism in the survival of the fittest. The individual is lost in the collective. Again, the end of a utopian society justifies the means of killing the poor and the weak. This naturally leads to another idea put forward by Plato that people who are perceived to have pure genetic materials should be encouraged to breed amongst themselves to produce a race of supermen fit for ruling over the masses. This selective breeding is called eugenics. Eugenics actually found its Enlightenment era origin in Charles Darwin's cousin, Sir Francis Galton. Galton regurgitated the thoughts of Plato in his work, Hereditary Genius, which was basically a racist tirade advocating a system of selective breeding for purposes of providing more suitable races or strains of blood a better chance of prevailing over the less suitable. In other words, trying to artificially speed the upward course that evolutionists thought we were naturally already on. In truth, selective breeding had been practiced for some time amongst the elite. Inbreeding was commonplace amongst the ruling class to protect the genetic purity of their future stock. Galton merely took this idea and popularized it as a legitimate science. This very same tradition was in fact practiced by Charles Darwin himself in the hopes of maintaining a genetic superiority in his own bloodline. Darwin married the youngest granddaughter of his maternal father. Researcher Ian Taylor reveals the outcome of this project. Darwin's idea of inbreeding to produce superior stock can be seen to be a complete disaster in the case of his own ten children. Of the ten, one girl Mary died shortly after birth. 
Another girl, Anne, died at the age of 10 years. His eldest daughter, Henrietta, had a serious and prolonged breakdown at 15 in 1859. Three of his six sons suffered such frequent illness that Darwin regarded them as semi-invalids, while his last son, Charles Jr., was born mentally retarded and died in 1858, 19 months after his birth. Science has shown that inbreeding actually leads to speedier destruction of the genetic code rather than evolution because of something called biological mutations, which is why so-called purebred dogs are in fact more prone to health problems than mixes. The errors in their genetic code multiply as they are bred amongst themselves over long periods. But where true science fails, the religion of scientism continues stubbornly on. If they had followed God's wisdom in Leviticus 18, they would have heeded the warning not to commit incest and they would have been all the better for it. In their own human wisdom, however, they persisted and reaped the consequences. The idea of eugenics continued to be promoted in the scientific community for a long time afterwards. At the turn of the 20th century in 1901, the Statistics Department of London's University College became the headquarters for the Eugenics Education Society. Motivated by Galton's vision of a future utopia, ruled by a genetically engineered pure elite, the eugenic society grew into a successful political movement and would eventually inspire Hitler's holocaust against the Jews. Population control is still a big issue for the elite today. As recently as May 24, 2009, the Times reported of a secret meeting of billionaires held in New York City, including the likes of Bill Gates and Oprah Winfrey, where the number one issue on the agenda was how to cap the global population at 8.3 billion. Watch this short report by Hal Lindsay for a good overview. According to a report in World Net Daily, some of the richest men and women in the world met secretly in New York recently. When the world's wealthiest individuals hold secret meetings, it's time to pay attention. In 1910, the six wealthiest men in the world met at Jekyll Island, Georgia. That meeting resulted in the creation, three years later, of the largest criminal enterprise ever devised, the Federal Reserve, so-called. Judging from the list of participants, the recent meeting in New York may result in something even more monumental. The London Times identified them as Bill Gates, David Rockefeller, Ted Turner, Oprah Winfrey, Warren Buffett, George Soros, and New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg. Based on the Forbes magazine list of billionaires, the room had a net worth of about $120 billion. With all the bailout figures we've heard recently, that doesn't sound like that much. Believe me, it is. $120 billion is about equal to the annual budget for all of New York State, from New York City to Buffalo and everything in between. The meeting, which took place in early May, was at the home of Sir Paul Nurse, a British Nobel Prize winning biochemist and president of Rockefeller University. Microsoft's founder Bill Gates called the meeting. The London Times reported the informal afternoon session was so discreet that some of the billionaires' aides were told they were at security briefings. Discreet is the British way of saying secret. I do not believe that it is coincidental that this meeting came only a couple of weeks after another super secret and more powerful group met in the secrecy in Greece, the Bilderberg Group. They have advocated a one world government for at least a century. They also see themselves as the elite saviors of mankind. According to the Times, the billionaires were each given 15 minutes to present their favorite cause. Over dinner, they discussed how they might settle on an umbrella cause that could harness their interests. Taking their cue from Gates, the report said they agreed that population control was the number one issue. Experts say the global population will top 7 billion in 2012. According to reports, at the meeting, Bill Gates outlined a plan to cap the global population at 8.3 billion. It all sounds so civilized, doesn't it? Here's the less politically correct but more accurate version. 
a group of unelected liberals with more money than many governments have just decided how many people will be permitted to live. This group of self-appointed governors will now have to draw up criteria to be used to decide who will not be permitted to live and how they will die. It can and will be dressed up in polite and civil terms, but in the end, it means certain people will have to die. The meeting was billed as a meeting of philanthropists wanting to do good. But one can put lipstick and pearls on a pig, and it'll still be a pig. In the final analysis, there's only way, one way to cap a population, by deciding who's permitted to live, and who, for the good of all, must die.